This morning we start our new mini series inside of uh, our year long uh, study of uh, the look at freedom. And so we're starting another book uh, of the Bible. If we're going to talk about reading his word and being faithful and being a church that is a training ground for the believer, what better way to train than go to the manual? School started last week, and it's funny. It doesn't matter how much technology you have, you still have some type of curriculum that you go by, something that you base your lessons upon and you want it to be the truth. Landon in uh, his history class watched a video on the history, the truth about history that the, your history books don't tell you about. Because you want to know the truth about how to live. And so what better way to get the truth on how to live than from God's Word? And this morning we will be starting an eight-week series uh, from the book of Colossians. So, looking uh, forward to it as we go all in. We just looked at how to live free and some things that uh, our freedom brings us. But we're not having to worry about our past. We're not having to worry about a death sentence that we've been given. Because we know that God is with us through our storms. He's with us on the mountaintops. He's with us in the valleys. When it doesn't seem like there's any hope left. There is God. And so we're going to look at, in the book of Colossians, this letter that Paul writes to a church that is, this is an exception to most of his letters. Because he never started the church in the city of Colossae. He never went there. He just has heard about them. And we'll run across a man in our text this morning who is only listed in one other book, and that's the book of Philemon, which is a book about a, was written to a slave owner about a slave that ran away and became a believer. And Paul sends him back to the slave owner and says, he's a believer now, he is your brother. And you need to forgive him. But this is the only time that we ever hear this man's name. But evidently he was a high person within the church here at Colossae. As most of Paul's letters, Paul writes this story of how to live a godly life. We'll see different things about what the ministry of the church is. We're going to look next week at the power and the glorification of Christ. Then we'll see how that we can be made alive in Christ. And then we get to put on some new clothes. Because our clothes are ratty as human beings. We need something new. And so we are to put on our new self. A new identity. That we are not who the world says we are. We are who God says we are. And then we'll end up looking at a few further instructions and we'll look at <clears throat> sorry children we'll look at the role of the home how children are supposed to honor and respect their parents even after they move out how wives touchy subject, wives are supposed to be submissive to their husband. But, but, before the guys get too cocky, it also says that the husband is supposed to be submissive to Christ. And as I say in, in every uh, wedding ceremony that I do, that yes, the wife is supposed to be submissive to the husband, but if the husband is doing what God has told him to do, there won't be a single thing that the wife won't be willing to do because he's listening to God and not listening to his cotton-picking man. 
for what we'll see. And throughout this entire study of the book of Colossians, we'll see that how if our everyday life and the life of society lived up to what is told in this one book, we would look so much different. And we would be healthy. And so this morning, we've got three things that we're going to look at in the first 14 verses. So if you're ready, let's go as we look at a hope that bears fruit as we dive all in to the book of Colossians. A hope that bears fruit. Uh, Mama planted a beautiful, big, tall, bushy rose bush in the front yard. Oh, it's so beautiful. It got so big that I uh, had to go in yesterday and tie some more string because it, it burst out of those. Beautiful bush. I mean, beautiful green leaves. It's probably about this tall at least. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful bush. That's all it is. It still has not put out a single rose. It's a bush. But you can go to the backyard and from a tiny little seed is a jungle back there with squash and zucchini and tomatoes and peppers and tomatoes and squash and pumpkins and tomatoes and pumpkins and squash and squash leaves uh, that you have to go around the yard go on the outside of the yard to go to the alley because you can't make it through from somebody smashing pumpkins there's pumpkin all over the place back there but here's here's the funny thing about all of that back there it has fruit on it it has vegetables it's growing. It's producing. The problem is, we don't need a hope that is just a hope. That's just an endless hope. That's just a word on a page. We need a hope that bears fruit. So let's dive in to verses 1 through 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. See, we should be thankful when we hear that God is moving and doing something somewhere. Too many times churches get so caught up that we are the only church. And if God's not doing something here, he better not be doing it anywhere else. You might need to an answer it. Maybe God calling you. Because <laughs> if it's not, then they don't need to call. All right. But this is when we are supposed to hear and rejoice at what God's doing in the world. He has not called every single church to go to one location, to minister to one certain group of people. There's a lot of people in our church that don't fit in all that well. I mean, we look good on the outside. But if they really knew about us, 
know about our past, we don't need people like you. I don't know where they get that from because Jesus didn't shun anybody because of their past. <laughs> what he actually did is when he found out about your past, which he already knew, he flocked to you. church gets so caught up and wrapped up on, well, if it's not happening here, it can't be God. No. Paul's never been to this church in Colossae. And he says, I thank God for you. I rejoice in what God's doing for you. Because Paul understands that there is one vine we're just the branches. He understood what the Pharisees did, that a house divided against itself will fall. That's the problem with so many churches, is we fight amongst each other over stupid stuff. We fight inside with one another over stupid stuff. Because we want to change the color of the carpet, and it's not my color that I chose, I'm going to leave. Of all the things in the world to get upset and leave over, you're going to leave over that? Okay. That's as dumb as going to some of these really large churches where you got over a thousand people in service and getting upset because the pastor didn't know your name and didn't shake your hand. There's hundreds of people that he didn't shake his hand, and he didn't know any of their names either. What matters is, are we excited about what God is doing here? And if he's not doing anything with us, maybe we need to go back and see, what are we doing wrong that he's not using us to do those things? See, we need to be thankful of what's going on. He said that we rejoice because you have heard in the word of truth the gospel which has come to you as indeed the whole earth is bearing fruit. The word can't help but bear fruit. It's shared. It's watered. It's planted. It grows. It blossoms. And it produces and it feeds so that it can be planted, watered, grown, blossomed, harvested, eaten, developed, and then the cycle just keeps going. See, that's what it is. None of you are here today in this church building or watching online because of this <laughs> church. This church building did nothing for you. Sorry. Whatever church you were at before you came here did absolutely nothing for you. It's a building. It's bricks. It's two by fours. Some of the newer ones, it's still two by fours. But it's a building. You are where you are, and you're here today because of someone inside of a church sharing with you, not the building. See, we are all members of one body because there is one Lord and one Christ, and that's it. And he is the only way. You don't see any Muslims bearing great fruit. Now you find some really nice Muslims. You don't find any Jehovah Witness that are bearing much fruit. But you can find some really good Jehovah Witness. You can find really good Mormons. But it's only followers of Jesus Christ, the, the only Son of God, who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, for our sins, three days later, rose again, 
40 days later, ascended into heaven and is ruling and reigning, making intercession for us, pleading our case before God, that one day when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, just as we saw last week, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, the evidence is enough for us, then we can be where he is. That's why Jesus said in John 14, let your hearts not be troubled. You believe in me, believe in God also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, surely I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. That if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back again for you. So that where I am, there you may be also. He's making the kingdom. Some some people, their mansion got ready. They are enjoying their reward. They're enjoying the harvest of their fruit. See, we have a hope that one day, following what God has said, not what the world says, not whatever feels good, whatever sounds good, whatever is popular today, doing what the Word of God says. We do that. We have a hope that endures and bears fruit. That's what makes all of the difference. That's what gives us great power. That's what, why in verse 27 we see it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Glory is the harvesting of the fruit. We rested from our labors. We receive our great reward. See, that's what it's all about. All that we do on this earth is to point others to Christ. Because if we're not pointing them to Christ, you know who we are pointing them to? To Satan himself. And that's one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter. is because there were people coming into the church saying that Christ wasn't the only Christ. That Christ wasn't God. And we'll get more into that next week about it. I'll give you some quotes from some so-called great Christian preachers that have basically said there was no God in Jesus Christ. Not sure where they find that in the Bible. I mean, you got to completely twist the scripture out of context to get that. See, we need a hope that bears fruit. But not only do we need a hope that bears fruit, we need to walk in that fruit. Because what good is it if you have all this fruit and vegetables laying around you? That garden, I mean, it is full. You can't see dirt from all of the plants. But what good is it to go out there and water, fertilize, and let it grow? take pictures of it and sit back and watch and say, man, that's a really nice garden. Look at all of that. And go back inside and leave everything on the vine to walk. You've wasted your work. You've wasted your money. You've wasted your time. And you've wasted the fruit. That's not what we've been called to do. That's not what we've been called to enjoy. We looked at the fruit of the Spirit, our apples and our oranges and our plums and our bananas. We looked at all of that. We are to produce the fruit because the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of us, producing it. That's why it says the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance. 
self-control, all of that is produced because Christ is living on the inside of us and bearing the fruit through us. But if we're not doing anything with it, what's the point? There are so much vegetables that's growing. Can't eat it all. Why well, we brought some up here today to share. Because that's what you do. When you have something good, you want to share with others. We want to share food with everybody. We want to share drinks with everybody. We want to share uh, the good things that happen in our life. We want to share that with everybody. But why is it that when it comes to the best thing in the world that we could ever have in Jesus Christ, we keep our mouths shut? Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Okay, so you don't want to offend anybody, but you offend the person who hung on the cross for you so that you can have eternal life. That makes it all right? Well, it's controversial. Okay, but not saying anything is why our world is. Because the generation prior to ours kept their mouth shut, and abortion became the law of the land, so that we can just kill just because we don't want to be bothered by the inconvenience of a child. Prayer was taken out of school. Bible clubs were taken out of school. But yet, we can have a satanic group meet. We can have the LGBTQ plus 8,000 other letters and shapes they can come up with. Yeah. They can meet. Well, we have to be tolerant of everyone. Yeah, tolerant of everyone and to the exclusion of Christ. Christ brings light to a dark world. Our generation was stupid and stayed silent because we just followed what the previous generation did, and that's why same-sex marriage is the law of the land. Here's the problem. Our parents stayed silent. We stayed silent. Y'all will follow in the same tradition and I hate to see what the next challenge for y'all notice that was just prayer abortion now we're destroying the home what's next but see if we walk in the fruit then things happen look at verses 9 through 12 And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There it is. Pray that you will end. We just finished watching the Olympics a couple of weeks ago. We were watching one of the marathon races, and the guy was coming around, and our guy in front of him raised his foot up and clipped the side of the runner behind him. Wasn't intentional, wasn't trying to trip him. He just barely came up and grazed the side, and it was enough to trip the guy behind him he, the guy that tripped the one behind him tripped, they both fell over each other. You know what they did? 
They helped each other up. And even though they were way, way far behind, they were the last two runners to cross the finish line. There's the key. They cross the finish line. I love watching the Special Olympics races. They don't know how to lose. Because one person falls, they all stop. They'll turn around and go back and pick up somebody and they'll all cross at the same time. They know how to win. They don't know how to lose. Because they've learned it's better to get across the line together than to leave someone behind. See, when we're walking in the fruit, we care more about others than we do our own. We care more about someone who has fallen down then we care about us getting the big trophy. We're happy and content with that stupid, worthless participation trophy. Then we are about having first place. Because what if, just what if, us caring for others helping them along the way, got them across before us. What if we stopped and threw a party for them and cheered for them? What if we had more care for others than ourselves? You know, Simone Biles got a lot of flack for dropping from a couple of events in the Olympics because of some mental health issues. Here was our take on it. You're on a balance beam. You're doing somersaults off of uh, the high bars. One misstep can be deadly, at minimum very detrimental. Snap a leg, land wrong, you're paralyzed, if you're not mentally focused, you're going to do harm to the team. And while she pulled out, she was still on the sidelines, cheering and yelling for her teammates. And this year was totally weird because there was no fans allowed in. The only fans that were there were your Olympic team. The teammates on the opposing teams were cheering for the opposing teams because they know what it's like to not be cheered. They were trying to encourage one another. If you can do that in the sports world, why can't we do that in the game of life? Why can't we encourage one another when they're down? Now, I'm all for telling the truth. We're not going to sugarcoat and say, oh, well, well, you know, God will forgive you for doing that. Well, God understands, or that was a long time ago. It's okay. No, you tell them the truth, but you tell it in love. Bashing somebody over the head, the turn or bump, burn method don't work like it did in the olden times. I could preach you a message and read it verbatim from Jonathan Edwards, The Great Awakening on uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You should Google it. Pull it up and read it. <clears throat> that was in the 1700s that that was written. You'd swear he wrote it yesterday. Because everything that's going on there funny how history in the world proves the Bible is true. When Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be again and will be again. See, we need to walk in our fruit. And the way that we do that is by following what God says. We live how God tells us to live. 
He tells us to honor your father and mother. You do that. To not have any other gods before me. Well, we do that. I don't have, we don't have any images up here that we sit down and worship, bow down to. I don't have mine with me. started with our weekends. Those go away. And in order for us to get them back, we have to pay a dollar. Money goes to a good cause. Paying for a trip. Or a vacation. But when this replaces our relationship with around it. Here's the thing. You can watch the Super Bowl. One team's going to win. One team's going to lose. You can not watch it, and guess what? It's going to happen. One team's going to win. One team's going to lose. And guess what? Here's the best part. This takes all the pressure off of you. They're not going to know that you watch. <laughs> I know I have that problem that with it when I get really into it. I, I mean, I'm right there yelling and talking back to it, but, you know, the players don't hear it. And unfortunately, the refs don't hear it either. But if we get so worked up over that, why can't we get worked up all over somebody spending the eternity? We'll walk in everything else. But when it comes to living how God said, that's too much work. That's too hard. Because it means we can't go to certain places that we like to go to. We can't do certain things we like to do. There's times that we can't be happy. 
happy in a certain situation. But we can be content knowing that God is already dealing with the situation. And he's right beside us. That's what walking in the fruit is all about. It's doing life as he has asked us and told us to do. It's loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving and praying for your enemy. Not wishing to pull out the double-barreled shotgun and blow their face off. That means praying for those who hate you and persecute you and accuse you falsely. It means standing up for what is right. Defending the helpless. Taking care of the widows and the orphans. And as the song we sang at the end this morning, asking God to make us a servant, not the master. See, we need more servants of the world. Because you're not going to find a better master than Jesus Christ. That's why he said in Matthew 11, 24, 29, Come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, broken down, wore out, come to me. I will give you rest. Take up my yoke, for my burden is easy and it's light. See, we need to walk. then we also see finally in the last two verses this morning that deliverance leads to redemption that brings about forgiveness. Yeah, I know, it's a long time. But it packs a powerful punch. Deliverance leads to redemption that brings about forgiveness. Which gives us freedom. Because we can be free today because we've been delivered, redeemed, and forgiven. Pretty powerful little verses here to close out in verses 13 and 14. He, talking about Jesus, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption which is the forgiveness of sin. There you go. There you go. Remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 2 when God created man? He told Adam, I give you dominion over this earth. But that's not what this verse says. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the dominion. Because Adam and Eve traded their dominion for a piece of fruit. Satan became the force here on earth. The prince of darkness, the prince of the air. Lowercase, Lord of the earth. But when Jesus came, he took care of business.
things that he did for us on the cross was that he took our sin. He took our shame. He took our past. He took our present. He even took our future. And he conquered sin and the grave. So that if we put our faith and our hope and our trust in him, there is no fear of the past. There is no fear of what is in the dark. Because we know who the light is. And because of that, notice what it says. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed us to a new kingdom. The kingdom of his beloved son. So we've got a new home. We don't live in the dark any longer. And not only that, it's a beautiful kingdom. And verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption. We were bought with a costly price. He didn't just go and take us. He didn't just go and steal us. Because Proverbs makes it abundantly clear that when a thief is found, he must pay back up to sevenfold of his household. Seven times what he stole, he has to repay, even if it means everything he has. Jesus didn't go and steal us from Satan. Because then we wouldn't be his. We'd be stolen property. He went slaves that we were so that we can no longer be slaves but receive that inheritance of eternal life of a home with him to see the streets of gold the gates of pearls all the beautiful jewels and crystal and everything and the tree that bears fruit in it every season and the river of life that flows from the throne of God, but more importantly, more than any of that, even more glorious and grand than seeing our loved ones that have gone before us, is we'll see Jesus face to face. We'll see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, the Hosanna of Hosannas. And we will fall down and sing that song that we ended with. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for making me home. That's because we have the redemption, which is the forgiveness of our sins. When we come to him, he is faithful and just, as James tells us, that he will forgive us of all our unrighteousness. Not just some, not just part, not just the easy ones. You know those deep down, Isaiah says that he wipes it white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as wool. And then he even goes a step farther and says that he casts our sin into the sea of unforgiveness. And it's there. And he chooses not to remember it. He doesn't forget it. Because if he can forget our sin, what keeps him from remembering that he saved us? What keeps him from, from not forgetting that we're his? He doesn't forget it. He says he chooses to remember it no more. So when we keep coming back to him and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for this. 
And we've already asked him to forgive us, and we were sincere in it. So I was like, what sin? What sin? I already cast that away. It's Satan who keeps reminding us that we're defeated. That we are slaves to sin. But we just saw here that if we live the life that he has called us to live and we put on him, <laughs> we're not defeated anymore. We aren't a defeated individual. We have been redeemed, which means we have been bought back by Christ's shed blood and we have freedom from our sins and freedom to live and freedom to go all in because he has set us free. He is our everything. So here's my question for you as we close this morning. Are you all in? Or are you holding back? God doesn't want just part of you. He wants all of you. He wants you to dive in deep. You know, when we go on vacations or something, there's a swimming pool. I don't think we've been to any that hasn't had the sign yet, but there's a sign all around the edge of the pool and then big sign up on the walls. No lifeguard on duty. No diving. Really, you want to dive in five foot water? Maybe eight foot? You don't want to do that. Clap is ten foot. So that way the mid tall people when they dive in, they're not busting their head open on the bottom. You don't want a Jaws moment. You're sitting there and all of a sudden you pick a bread of water. No, we don't want that. But here's the thing with God. He begs us. He desires for us to die in deep. When you enter into a relationship with someone, whether it be a friend or uh, in a dating relationship. You don't want just surface level. Hi, how are you? Let's be friends. And that's all that ever stays. You want a good friend. That when you have a problem, you can go to them. And you know good and well that if you share something with them, it stays right there. You want that deep kind of friendship. If you want that deep kind of friendship, if you want that deep kind of relationship with someone of the opposite sex that you want to date, potentially to marry, why do you just want a superficial, surface-level relationship with the God who created you. He's on asking, I just want you to know me. I just want you to know that I'm God. He says, I want you to be still and know that. I want you to know that I am with you even to the end. I want you to know that I am a brother who's, I am a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I want you to know that you are the apple of my eye. I want you to know that you are my masterpiece. I want you to know that I love you with an undying and unending love. I want you to know that I love you so much that I put my spirit inside of you. I want you to know that I love you so much that my arms will never shut towards you, no matter what you do. Oh, I'm asking, are you all there? Are you ready to? 
Paul doesn't need shallow Christians. The world needs bottom-dwelling, deep-diving believers who are willing to do the hard work to bring the loss down deep. Because it's when you go deep that you learn that the Lord your God is a warrior amidst you. And no matter how bad you mess up, no matter how bad your situation looks, and even though you think you have let God down, give you some good news to ease your mind on that. God's God, he don't need you to hold him up. Because if he's counting on us to hold him up, I need a new God. I need a God that's stronger than me on my strongest day. And even when you feel worthless in the gym, you said in the prayer, when you're anxious, those anxious moments that we all have from time to time. He says that he quiets us with his love. He rejoices over you with sin. See, we don't understand creator of the universe sings over his creation. And if he's singing over his creation, how can we not rejoice and sing back to him? Are you all in? You ready to dive deep? No waiters. No waiters. No snorkeling gear. Let's fill up the oxygen tanks. The dual pack. With the extra extension hose so it can tie onto the boat. So they can keep pumping it full. Let's dive down deep. See a lot of fish this deep. that you came to redeem. We say thank you. May we walk in your truth. May we have a hope that bears the fruit to the world. And we thank you deliverance that leads to redemption that brings about our forgiveness. May we never forget what you've done for us. And may we never forget about the loss. They need to hear about what you've done for them. We're asking you 
go with us as we do.